I'm kind of excited to share with it because I think we have some new strategies as we move forward to do it as well. So um, July 1st, the public comment period opened. Um, we did broad communication to the field, sent out letters, emails, um, and then we um, are here today hopefully to adopt those rules that will become effective on the 30th of September. So the community engagement that we did, because we had, you know, there had been some community engagement, but we really needed to go out and do more. We did four online engagement sessions um, and three online. We have four bullets. Oh, uh, well, there, there was the OAELP was an online. Oh, it was session. on. Okay. So we had 90 registered family providers join us for um, an online engagement. Um, 79 certified family and 111 certified centers um, participated in an online. Um, I think, you know, this was a pretty small set of rules, but we were really encouraged by how many people participated. It can see looking at how can we limit it to more so that there can be a, a discussion, but that that is really something we can look look towards for you know forward at maybe other ways to do engagement that really helps people who maybe can't part travel, part you know, different ways. Um, and then we did uh, the Oregon Association of Early Learning Professionals. Um, we, there are six providers that sit on that, and so we did an engagement session with them as well to get their input and feedback. And then we did two in-person engagements. Um, uh, AFSME was having a conference and asked us to come, um, and so we had 30 providers um, in which we were able to do face-to-face. Um, engagement with as well as then they were convening a small group in the Dalles and so we did engagement um, out in the Dalles for this set of rules. Um, so I wanted to highlight some of the changes um, that were made um, from the public comment and that are reflected in your packets. Um, we you know a lot of it is about clarifying is a lot of where the rule input comes from and I you know it, it gets to why interpretive guides and guidance documents but also what can we do in rule to clarify and so um, within the serious injury definite definition of when you call as we change from um, severe burns to all burns um, qualify while on child care premises for safe sleep requirements um, there was a lot of conversations like if a child um, is in a stroller and you're at the park and they fall asleep in the stroller, you know, what do you do? And so it's like when the child's on the premises where care is provided, that's when you would not leave them in a device. Um, so we clarified that within, um, and that's within all four sets of rules, the regulated subsidy, center, certified family, registered family. Um, then within the three types of licensed care, um, clarified that um, the, the certificate of registration, which is the license that we provide, um, needs to be clearly viewed as it's posted. And so there was that one providers wanting to make sure that that was clear, it needed to be clearly there. Um, and then for a certified family and certified center, um, clarify that a person's authorized to drop off and pick up a, cho a child have access to that child. And so I think that's some of the language that maybe we need to do the technical fix because um, some of the feedback was it's not just the parent, it's whoever is authorized to pick up that child should be able to come into any license and have access to that child. So those were the changes that we were able to make to clarify. Um, and then as well as it was noted that you were able that we'll be doing interpretive guides and um, guidance documents. And I think the really nice part about the guidance documents is that can be more of a iterative, we need more clarity, we can add and adjust to those as we go versus um, going through a rule process. 